Welcome, everybody, to episode, our 10th visit together. Hey, I'm Dan John. I'm in Salt Hill, Ireland, which is right next to Galway City. And it is an absolutely wonderful day here on the bay, the, the west coast. Uh, it's called the Wild Atlantic Way. The Galway Bay is right there. Literally, you could hit it with a discus easily from my apartment. Uh, I was walking over last Saturday. I went to the... Uh, Irish Powerlifting Championships, uh, uh, I think it was called IPL, and they hosted it here in Galway. So when I'm in Galway, I go to rugby games, GAA, that's the Irish sports of hurling and, and football and handball, and weightlifting. I go to any event uh, I can, and I walked over there, and I couldn't get a cab. Something bad had happened. It, it was a fair walk. So I walked there in a just torrential rainstorm, and it was interesting because as I walked, I started thinking about my workshops in the past year, talking about cueing people and then versus coaching pe people. Just to review, if you have an exercise that lasts two minutes, there's no movement, like a plank, you can probably give the person three to five cues. Like if I was doing the push-up position plank, the cues would be, you know, grip and rip the ground, really squeeze the ground hard, you know, crush your armpits so hard that if you had grapes in there, it turned into wine, squeeze your knees together, squeeze your heels together. Those are all cues. But coaching is something a little different. Coaching is when you take the athlete aside and you, you either review the movement. I was about to say replay the movement and then foreplay it, but then I realized it to be an issue with the second word. But you review what just happened and then you kind of preview the fixes and the ideas and remind the athlete, we went over this three years ago. We worked on this two days ago. We practiced this. Or – Hey, that's on me. We need to do a better job doing this, this, and this. So cueing is sometimes a very quick word or two. Whereas the true coaching is the cliche has been the 30,000 foot view, the big picture. You get real high and you look down. Cueing is in the moment. Coaching is big picture. And I think a lot of people, especially when I watch young personal trainers, they mix those two up. They, they talk to someone in performance. Well, if someone's talking to you, you have to process all that through your brain. And the problem is you often, you often don't have time to do a movement and process information, and there's no way you're going to make a correction. Well, what got me thinking is about my two favorite cues are squeeze and stay tall. And it was interesting because on the way there, I all of a sudden this whole movement matrix that I've been coaching for a long time. All of a sudden, I started to see that stay tall is probably the key coaching point I make in everything that I do. So if we're doing a kneeling plank, uh, again, you can go to my, uh, uh, my YouTube account if you don't know the exercises. But if you do a kneeling plank, one of the things we're trying to teach you is to stay tall. We're also trying to test your hip flexors to make sure they're flexible enough. Uh, find out if you know how to use your, your, your butt to, to, to stay strong. Uh, there's a thing called a vertical plank. You put your hands in that kind of uh, Frankenstein's monster position, and then you pull down. Well, that makes teaches the ab wall to contract, the butt to contract, and to teach to stay tall. Oddly, when you look at the hip thrust this way, right from here, you'll notice that it's a kneeling plank just flipped over. So the hip thrust is a stay tall. The goblet squat finishes in a stay tall. The swing finishes in a stay tall. Uh, a, great, a very good American Olympic lifting coach by the name of Joe Mills used to basically teach his athletes that the key was to stay tall. And, of course, squeeze is what your mu your muscles can only do one thing, and that's contract. Uh, I guess they could try to not contract, too. That would be the opposite. But, so every time you lift or move or do anything, you squeeze. But one of the hard things to teach people, besides stay tall, is to learn to – stay tight, to squeeze, to lock down. And as I was walking, I've been working on this ever since, so it's been uh, three or four or five days, I've been working on putting together this idea into some kind of uh, intelligent, readable concept that would be, once. and here's the funny thing about this, once you look at it, it becomes so apparent and obvious, people go, well, sure, yeah. Well, if it's so sure, yeah, why hasn't anyone ever said this basically before, which is an issue you get a lot of times in my field. The, 
the simple, the beautiful, and the elegant, the masterful are always obvious. It's the other nonsense that isn't so much. And of course, I think most of it's nonsense. Well, that's just an idea. I just want to let you know what I'm doing. Uh, we've had a wonderful time here. Uh, been to a couple of different, we went to a good rugby game up in uh, Belfast, Ulster versus Cardiff. I got a big rugby game this weekend. Uh, my my boys from Connick are playing uh, uh, Leinster, so that's, that's a big game. And, um, and life's been great. And so let's start answering some questions and we'll move on, okay? So let me put the questions up for this week. Stefano asks an interesting question, uh, and I, I would say it's interesting because there's some assumptions being made by Stefano that we need to talk about. How does the fast mimicking diet affect muscle mass? Do you lose muscle mass during the five days? Well, that's the funny thing, Stefano. So what if you do? You know, I've been lifting weights since 1965. Uh, some of my best insights from weightlifting came in 1975, 1991, 2004. Uh, that's a long time. I don't worry about losing literally an ounce or two. It, 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 I don't even know if you'd even notice it. Uh, it is funny how if you lose fat, everyone notices. But when you lose lean body mass, it's a little bit more subtle. But I guess, Stefano, what I'm trying to get across here is if you take five days off a year and you do the fast mimicking diet, that gives you 360 days a year to think about you know, bulking up building mass. That's a lot of time. But there's one thing I want you to kind of keep in mind for the rest of your career. There's health. That's the optimal interplay of the human organs. There's longevity with the quality and quantity issues. There's fitness, the ability to do a task. And then there's performance, which, which I do. I teach my people, when your name is called, you step up. The fast mimicking diet seems to be a way that you can help both your health and your longevity in these small spurts of five days. Well, if you did it monthly, like I was doing for a while, I'll probably keep doing it basically monthly, bi-monthly for a long time. You know, I'm, I'm trying to focus on my health and longevity there. However, it wouldn't be a terrible idea for me to actually perform uh, at the end of a fast mimicking diet just to see truly you know, how much of you know, how carb and protein dependent am I as a competitor? Listen, it takes me 1.6 seconds to deliver the discus, maybe 15 seconds to turn a caber. That's just a lot, not a lot of time. <laughs> I don't need to go into deep fat stores to <laughs> throw the discus one time. So one of the things I'm just kind of cautioning you on, always make sure you kind of keep in your mind a little bit of a spread. I'm doing these things like flossing. Flossing is good for your health. Flossing is good for your longevity. And really, if you think about it, if you have terrible teeth, it'd probably hurt your performance. But you floss every day because it makes the whole system better. And when you do something like fast mimicking diets, you're doing that for a short amount of time to make the whole system work a little better. So even if you do lose a little bit, so what? I noticed this. After my fast mimicking diet weeks, the next week's workouts are some of the best I've ever had in my life. Because, you know, honestly, you're going from you're going from a, a pretty rough little five days to normal, and your new normal is just off the charts. So uh, just rethink it a little bit, and don't worry so much about any short-term anything, okay? Um, Chris Harvey writes us, I'd love to see, I would love to hear some more of your opinions on optimal training for police officers. Well, it depends on the job, but one thing you guys have to teach yourselves well, besides tension and arousal control, which is a huge issue, you know, those uh, L.A. police uh, beatings, when they came out, they found that police officers who drive alone have a much lower chance of uh, beating someone because of being with somebody else. You kind of get ratcheted up and uh, you've got to learn to control your your arousal. You got to learn to control your tension. So you do need to do things like deadlift, which teaches you maximal tension. And then when the moment you let it go, whew, it all comes down. Um, but you guys have a specific issue. Uh, I was told years ago by one of my students who was a sheriff. He said, badge, pistol, car. He said, those three things stop most problems before they even start. 
But one of the issues you guys have is that third one, car. And if you're driving around all day long, you know, and doing paperwork and you stand up for a short amount of time and you sit back down, and then you're expected to do something dynamic, yeah, you're in trouble. Um, so one of the things you have to probably do is something that we would call, I used to call lip and but now I call them uh, lift and sprints, where you do gobble squats followed by sprints, uh, hinge work, deadlift followed by sprints, immediately, immediately, immediately. Uh, you wouldn't even be a terrible idea for you to do some things in the workout where you sit in a chair and then bounce out and, and sprint. Um, you need to work a lot on your, so that, that would be number one, would be the Litvinov's families, and then thinking clearly about the, the chair problem. The second thing you want to think about is what I call level training. Uh, the mistake a lot of police officer guys I know train like bodybuilders. And you look, okay, so you look impressive when you get out of the car, but if you have to chase somebody, you're going to be in trouble. So, and if something comes down, you have to be able to change levels. So a good workout for a police officer would be something like goblet squats, followed by prowlers, followed by push-ups, uh, a hinge movement by sprint, finishing with something on the ground. So you practice getting up and down and changing levels. But uh, Chris, it's, it's always difficult working with police officers because they're such a specter uh, of what they do uh, as, as their duties, it would be interesting to to look at the health of uh, police officers who do more foot patrolling versus car patrolling. But, you know, in the States, you have the highway patrols or troopers who basically spend all day in cars. It would be interesting to look at their health versus, you know, uh, someone who does the old-fashioned patrols. But uh, it's, it's a difficult field that you're in. And, and I do. I, I appreciate what you guys do for a living. But um, very much so. Um, but you also have to think when it comes to you in your field that, you know, I always worry about the health of police officers, the longevity, the life longevity of police officers, much more than I worry about their fitness levels. Uh, the stresses of being a police officer are very high. So to me, um, any interventions I would do with the police officer corps would be a little bit more on the health and uh, longevity side. When I work with special forces guys, the older guys get it when I talk about that. The younger guys think, you know, that they're, they're, you know, they're immortals, they're, they're demigods, and that's just not true. Uh, we have an email from a Jorn Philip Wolf. What is the best way to, uh, but what is the best way or program to start over when you have had been out of training for motivational reasons after injury? Okay, so you've been out of training because of an injury. Uh, for me, I can't wait to train again. I mean, I just can't wait. Uh, that's because maybe uh, I'm a psychopath. But uh, for motivational purposes, I think it helps, especially with some of my big surgeries, you know, with the, the ones where I start off in, in a walker and move to crutches and move to a cane. That whole time you're moving around in a, in a walker, the only thing I can think about is getting to crutches. And when I'm in crutches, I can't wait to get on a cane. And when I'm a cane, I can't wait to go for a walk here in Galway. Um, so for me, it's it's really simple to find the motivation. I don't want to be like this the rest of my life. And oddly, there's a meme that goes around uh, where, it's, you know, I can't I can't remember what the whole thing is, but basically the guy go, the doctor says something like, you need to diet and exercise, and the patient says something like, can't you just give me a pill for that? Um, I've never been a big believer in the pill for it answer to this, but we know the magic of sleep, of diet, uh, sleep, proper nutrition and appropriate exercise. We know the magic of it. So I guess, um, I'd like to be able to sit down with you and wonder why you even asked the question, you know, because what I've seen in my career is the people with the little injuries, uh, you know, sometimes you hear the word niggling niggling and I'm not even sure what the word niggling means but I heard a, a, a Gaelic football player use it the other night he has niggling injuries these small little these small little injuries that just keep biting you uh, to me I think it's harder to come back from tiny injuries than major injuries major injuries when you got a six month to a year long recovery you know, you have a lot of time to rethink and reload your brain and say, 
you know, I can't wait. Whereas if you've got a lot of tiny injuries and you're constantly getting, you know, uh, my wife and I always talk about being uh, parents as being pecked to death by ducks. If you've got these little injuries that are just pecking at you, it's going to be real hard to, it's going to be real hard to find the enthusiasm of training. Okay, the next one is from, hi, Ranger. Hi, Ranger. Uh, during the overhead squat, how deep should you go? I think you should go as deep as you can. And uh, you're about to ask me about Stu McGill. I don't even have to look at it because I know. And I agree with Stu. But I also think that sometimes you just have to go deep. Let me see what we got here. How deep? Ah, there we go. Dr. Stuart McGill tells us to go as deep as to the point where your spine doesn't change shape. Great. He specifically says that there is not to be any lumbar flexion under load. In my case, as I go to rock bottom, I don't think my spine flexes, but there's a, there is a certain decrease in the degree of extension. Is it okay to go rock bottom? Well, I can't see you when you write it, but I mean, I would say, yeah, try it out. You know, um, I'm a big believer in the movement of deep squats. Now, that's the problem I run into a lot of people. You think I'm talking about load. I'm talking about the movement here. Um, I'm sitting on the edge of a couch uh, here, but, you know, I'm only a few inches, you know, from right now I'm into a, a deep goblet squat. Uh, right now, I, I just dropped into one. And I'm 62 years old, and I spend time every day just sitting in a deep squat. Now, I'm not sure if my back is in flexion or extension, but I know if I was on the Appalachian Trail and uh, nature calls, I would want to get as deep as I can on the ground just for long-term hygiene purposes. So the movement is crucial. The load is the, the issue. Now, I'm a big believer in loading up uh, overhead squats. But really, once you get the body weight in the overhead squat, I've never seen a lot of value after that. More reps at body weight, certainly. Now, there's one of my articles, I, I quote a guy from California, Mike Weeks, who says you should be able to do 15. Well, that's probably excessive, but a few would be nice. Um, with the front squat, I've never seen much value after about, well, you ought to be able to, whatever you clean, it would be nice to do one, two, or three front squats with it. But some of my best lifts of my life, they were the clean, clean and jerks, were my max front squat because I wasn't born in the front squat. Uh, Vasily Alexei of the great weightlifter said that your squat should never really be more than 10 kilos, 22 pounds more than your clean and jerk. After that, he said, it was just, it became another exercise that might not help you at all. So I guess the point is just keep in your mind separating them out. Uh, we're talking about movement versus load. I think if you're working on the movement and you have reasonable weights, yeah, it goes deep as you need to. If you're going to try to do, you know, 200 kilos, 440, and you got one knee going this way, one knee going that way, your back going this way, your back, yeah, I would, uh, I would drop the bar if I were you. Um, but only over 400 pounds. Okay, that was a joke. All right, let me get a sip here. This is called Irish whiskey. Uh, excuse me. Uh, hot whiskey. It's 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 a herbal drink. It's got lemon, cloves, honey, whiskey, and water. Not very much whiskey, but it is a phenomenal drink on a cold day after hitting the Galway Bay. Okay, we have a, a one of our kind listeners, Jay, uh, is emailing us. My nephew is 13 years old and has started lifting weights for football. Um, that's that's good because you want about 10 months to get ready. As far as I can tell, he's doing the classic teenage lifting program of maxing out every workout on bench and squat. And he can get away with that for a while because he's in that basic baby early learning curve like I was when I went from 65 pounds to 75 pounds to 85 pounds to 95 pounds to 132 pounds in a few weeks in my lifts. Uh, the next year I benched 200. The next year I benched 300. The next year... You wouldn't believe me. Was. So when you first start, yeah, you can kind of get away with that. I like your follow up. My question is, how can I gently nudge? And I like that him towards more sensible workouts and good form on lifts without boring him to death. That's excellent. So I have to agree 100 percent with my one of my real heroes, Marty Gallagher. He insists 
absolutely on perfect technique, every movement, every time. Um, he has a part of his book, a part of his book, Strong Medicine, has his progressions in the lifts. I think in the bench press, I think you move to the double dumbbell bench, you move to the bench press, you move to the incline, you move to the military. In the squat, you go air squat, you know, body weight squat, goblet squat. Uh, there's then a couple other squat variations, but that's real simple. I, I agree with him 100% where you build not, you build the load and the exercise progression at the same time. So that might be something you want to talk, think about. So uh, um, if he's squirreling on his bench press like this, you know, slide two dumbbells or kettlebells in his hands and make him bench double ke uh, double kettlebell, double dumbbell. And that will clear up all the squirreling that, the, you know, they kind of go like this when they bench press. In the squat, I think every day should have air squats, maybe as a warm-up. Every day should have goblet squats, maybe as a warm-up. But to practice excellent technique. So – I think your question is excellent. So get yourself an exercise progression and marry that with a load progression. So we're moving ahead all the time. Uh, it'll be fascinating because, you know, you could probably do goblet squats for a month, slide to front squats for a month, slide to back squats for a month. If you could, well, or the way I would teach you be goblet squats, overhead squats, front squats, back squats. And when you come back to goblet squats, call it your deload time, you'll notice that all kinds of things are better. And as you move back up again, the load will increase over and over and over. Remember, exercise selection is one of the real lost gems of modern training. That's why I think that site that Brian put together, Dan John Workouts, is so good. It's because first you pick out your tools. And the other thing you also pick out is appropriate exercises for you. Uh, Nicholas. I am a father of a 13-year-old male swimmer. I have yet to find any articles or interviews of you working with swimmers or offering advice to high school swimmers. Yeah, good. Well, because I don't. So that would be a reason. I value your opinion and would appreciate your thoughts. My basic understanding of swimming is that streamlining while exerting force through an arm movement and kicking is the key. I think so. It seems to me that the various kettlebells and body weight movements would be the ideal. I would agree with you. I think that gobble squats, presses, swings, and get-ups would be good in season as well as off-season. I think you're right. Uh, a major concern for swimmers is shoulder health. Any thoughts you have for shoulder health would be helpful. Um, you know, one of the great pioneers, in fact, two of my heroes in the sport were both swimmers. Uh, John Jerome, who wrote Staying Supple, which I still think is probably – the best flexibility book I've ever read, flexibility and mobility book I've ever read. I still, every time someone asks me a question, I just go back to his book. Now, everybody invented what he said later, but he was one of the people who said it first. That's sarcasm in case you missed that. Um, but he also wrote a book called, called Staying With It, about being a master swimmer. And I think some of his best chapters on him relearning technique as a master swimmer. And, of course, the other person is Indiana's James Councilman, who was the first proof person basically to prove – we all knew it in track and field, but he proved that weightlifting helps swimmers. Now, it comes with a caveat. He kept trying to find machines, He's, and they're still around at many gyms. It's the, the weird little – it's a bench with a pulley system on it like this. You lay down and do this. Now, the problem is, is that that's too close. And we know with specific sports conditioning, specific sports training, too close hurts. Uh, shooting weighted basketballs is murderous on your free throws. Um, it, it does work in some cases. Overweight shots in the shot put work. Overweight discs. I've, I know that the East Germans made it work, but I've never made it work. Uh, overweight in the javelin doesn't work. It seems to me as it, you, as you ramp up speed, it's harder and harder for overweight implements to help with the higher speeds. So I like your idea. Just get them strong. You know, the, the problem and what's going to happen is they're going to go in the weight room, they're going to bench press. When you combine bench press with the, probably the butterfly and the crawl, you're probably going to look at a lot of extra shoulder issues that you just brought on yourself. 
Uh, I agree with you on kettlebells. I would argue the goblet squat, the Turkish getup, the goblet squat. Not bad. General, general movements, good for mobility, nothing fancy. The single arm kettlebell press part here, and you come all the way up on every rep. I think that would be very wise because in my in my experience, it is like a an absolute win win with, uh, with no shoulder problems there. And then of course uh, I would, if you can, turn this young man into a, a pulling machine, a pull up machine. I don't think you probably if if I could do everything again as a coach and athlete, I would do a lot more pull ups. Uh, you notice I didn't say jog like some people say or this and that, but I would do a lot more pull ups. Uh, yeah, you ask about using cleans and snatches. Uh, yeah, I would. I, I you're gonna have, you're gonna be teaching this person a whole new thing in the off season. Maybe just get them strong with deadlifts. Make it as simple as you can. Stay away from anything fancy with the shoulder. The shoulder's getting enough work. That was a good question. Thank you for asking. Okay, Matt. In all of your articles, interviews, podcasts, etc., I don't see where you discuss direct neck work. Right. Try to make it work like every coach I've ever worked with. We all try to make neck work work. We used to do the Nautilus four-way neck machine. I've done the weighted helmets. I've done the straps. And all it seems to do for most of us is give us neck problems. Um, I just think that the neck is a little bit – you've got a lot of vertebrae in an area that big. And um, – so when we wrestled, we used to do the, the neck bridge, and, and I thought there was value to it. Um, but really, direct neck work, I just, I, if, I, if you could come up with a way, Matt, of doing the movements, uh, finding movements that helped without hurting, that would be the million-dollar key. One thing I have worked on in the last few years, and this is from my own posture, is doing loaded carries. Uh, it has to be very light. Um, 10 to 25 pounds, so we're looking at just a few kilos to 10 kilos, and dragging weights. So I put the strap here and the sled's over there, dragging weights this way, dragging weights this way. For whatever reason, it seems to clear up posture issues without the damage of all this. Now, you, you follow it up about with, you know, like Aikido and, and the martial arts, but the best thing you learn from the martial arts is how to fall. So... If you're doing direct neck work and it gives you a stiff neck and you, you fall, you might be dead. But if you learn to fall correctly, you don't really need to worry, worry about the neck so much. Yeah, Matt, you will notice that very few experienced strength coaches are comfortable talking about neck work. It's just direct neck work. Certainly heavy shrugs. I get it. I've seen it work. It's fine. I do like the sled pulls, the light ones. Don't go crazy. Um, it's just... It's that cost and benefit thing. It's just really hard to make it work. Just really hard to make it work. You know, the benefit you get from strength and neck, you might lose from six weeks with, the, you know, being, you know, trying to do this. Now, it is interesting. Nearly every friend I have is my age. When you tap them on the shoulder, they all go like this. Because we all have bad necks from American football back in the 70s. We were taught to use our heads as a weapon. So every, every friend I have, has one side they can turn too easily and the other they can't turn too hardly at all as you can see with me so the neck is a the neck is a fragile item and you know I, if if we were working with if you were a boxer and we we're trying to get rid of a glass jaw i mean maybe neck work would work but it might be just as good as for you to duck a little better you know so there you go wish i could do better than that okay Thank you. Okay, so this is for Eric. I'm 38 years old. Congratulations to you. And I have been in the weight room since I was 15. I have competed in Olympic weightlifting and powerlifting. I have attended seminars by you, still my favorite. Okay, keep asking questions then. Uh, Ripito and others. All that means in a nutshell is that I have been taught the proper way to squat. I understand the value of the barbell squat, and I've barbell squatted for many years. My question is, what is your opinion on the belt squat machine? Oh, okay, just get to that. After years of lifting sports and time in the military, barbell back squats and my back don't agree, as happens with everybody, especially if you're a level bar. Now, I've recently fallen in love with the belt squat machine. Oh, that's a great piece of work. 
the purpose of the Goblin Squat is to replicate um, the Belt Squat, where you're sliding between the legs. Uh, I have, uh, of course, I haven't been doing it in, uh, in a few weeks because I've been here in Ireland, but back home, I got, I bought uh, Brett Contreras' T handle, and I've been doing those uh, straddle squats again, uh, the stra straddle deadlift. The straddle deadlift and the belt squat, to me, are the same family of exercises. Um, but one of the things both of them do is remind, remind you that we are not built on top of our legs. This is not on top of my legs. I am slung between my legs. And the goblet squat tries to teach you to slide between your legs. Uh, one of the things you might be noticing, because back with the belt squats, okay, obviously you don't have the load on, on the spinal column. Okay, that's obvious. But the other thing, you, you might just be squatting better. You might be squatting cleaner between your legs. So even though... Even though you, you might be right that the back squat you know, hurts your back, it might be that you have far better technique in the belt squat. Okay? It's a good question. Thank you. Jim, I am 63 years old. Have been training one way or another. Another? Another? Who, who can forget another? Off and on for about half a decade. Okay, so that takes you back to about 57, 58. Bodybuilding, powerlifting month. Never been great, but at least above average. Currently overweight, about 36% body fat, and moderately active. Should I take your advice at face value or make adjustments and or have different expectations considering my, my age? Of course, it would be interesting to know what you think my advice is. Um, one of the things I'd like you to do at 63 and at 36% body fat is go see a doctor. Uh, let's make sure we have a good blood profile. Uh, I did that. Uh, about every couple of years, I have to do that colonoscopy, which isn't great. Um, I did that uh, stress EKG last year, uh, which was fascinating because when I was in the machine, the man leaned over and said, uh, what are you here for? I go, to get a stress test for my heart. He goes, my heart rate was 59. And when they shot the thing into me, which just freaks you out, it shot up to uh, 75, which he said was the lowest he'd ever seen. Uh, there might have been other issues, but. So you do these tests, and it'll give us, uh, uh, and with some medical intervention and some real true what's going on inside of you, we probably can. Uh, so, Jim, what I'm trying to get you to do is go see a doctor, go see a dentist, go see an eye doctor, and try to get some medical help and advice. And then from there, let's look at what would be the brightest thing for you to do. Um, I mean, I don't know what your sleep habits are, but that's going to be the first thing I'd like to spend some time with. The next thing I'd like to know more about is what, what kind of uh, what's your food issues, what, what's your nutritional work like, and then and then of course the easy one will be exercise because I, I would recommend to you uh, going for long walks and you know, just do basic bodybuilding and uh, just basic bodybuilding, uh, a push, a pull, and a squat, and some mobility work for a few weeks. Um, you know. Nothing crazy, you know, three sets of five, you know, something like that. Nothing, nothing, nothing bad at all. Uh, not many exercises either. And really spend your time trying to get your sleep hygiene uh, addressed and then uh, any nutritional interventions we need to do. Okay? So, Jim, I'm going to ask you, as I often ask people, if you don't mind a follow-up question, which is a little bit more, uh, let me know about your medical history. Uh, let me know some basics about your nutrition. And let me know um, what your what your home gym equipment is like. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I'm gonna love this next question. It's from Josh. Okay, thank you, Josh. Josh asks, wanted to start by saying thank you for the gifting the world, DanJohnWorkouts.com. Well, Merry Christmas to all of you here. It's 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 been a joy, and please don't give me any credit for it. It's Brian. Every <laughs> let me go back to go back to Utah. Everybody knows that it's Brian, not me. Everybody knows that. All right. What a life changer has been for me and my wife. Even my four kiddos, 12, uh, got a 12-year-old boy, 9-year-old girl, 5-year-old girl, 3-year-old boy, boy, girl, boy, girl, easy to set the table, are joining us in our evening training. Hands down, the greatest uh, website ever created. I blush. I do have one question. I am in law enforcement, another law enforcement question and a member of the Air National Guard. 
We have to complete a yearly PT test requiring a one and a half mile run, push ups, sit ups, and waist measurement. How would you incorporate this in training during the year? And then finally, uh, curveballs, I have two surgically repaired knees. Okay, so we got to stay off those knees as much as we can. Um, so I would suggest, I mean, the thing like the push-up and the sit-up test, and even the, now the waist measurement, you, you're you a big kid here. You know, you're, you're a police officer and air national guardsman. You know what to do, right? You know to go for longer walks and you need to, some, something has to be eliminated out of your life. I'm not sure what it is. But on those tests, uh, one thing I do like about what Brian and I have answered a similar question this recently, but I would suggest ignoring those tests up until about eight to 12 weeks before you get tested. And, and I literally mean that, ignore them. Uh, I would train uh, reasonably. You're doing the Dan John workouts. That's, that's reasonable training. But I would add in, well, uh, the, the, the joke is, the, the phrase now is uh, go hard, uh, go heavy, go long. So one day a week, I would say I, uh, all the time, is you have a long walk a long bicycle ride, a long swim, uh, a long hike. And since you got the four kids, I mean, you know, um, maybe the hike would be, you know, because you're going to end up carrying one of them. So that would be really kind of a maybe a real good thing to do. Uh, you're going to have to – so if you do the Dan John workouts and you do one day a week do something long, and I'm thinking it, it has to be over 20 minutes, and I would think to prepare for a one-and-a-half-mile run – you would have to be sneak up on an hour, okay? Just go out and go on. Don't worry about anything except grinding that hour in, okay? And then one day a week, you're going to have to do something a little bit, you know, a little bit of metabolic conditioning. Uh, um, I don't know what you what equipment you have, but uh, Marty Gallagher just put up a really good little workout that you can do on the, the – it's the exercise cycles that go like this, uh, I don't know whatever they're called, exercise cycles that go like this. And, you know, if you got bad knees, the nice thing about these machines is that you can really crank up some intervals doing it with no, with really no hit on your knees. Uh, the rowers would probably be the same too. You know, you might want to try something. It was called the Trembly Protocol years ago. I don't know if people can talk about it. But it would be two minutes of just gentle, just gentle. You're just getting, even on the rower, you know, you might – you're not going to row very far in that in that two minutes, and then go all out for a minute. Too easy, one all out. Uh, you could probably work too easy. If we do five rounds of that, that's 15 minutes. That would probably in the, be in the wheelhouse of a mile and a half run. So you'd probably want to have. I mean, maybe some days go, some weeks do 10 rounds of that some weeks five, and then just play around, you know, once a month do 10, once a month do five, and then just roll the dice for the other two numbers. And if it's a, you know, if you're only going to do two rounds, that's fine too. The idea is just, just to get a little bit of interval work in. Okay. I really thank you for the kind words. That uh, means a lot. And uh, uh, just once you get close to those tests, then you'll start doing the push-ups, the sit-ups, and you sh should have your waist uh, uh, measurements. Uh, they, they should be fine. And honestly, your push-up in a traditional training program should be covered too. The sit-ups are a little bit um, – uh, I just think I can push myself through a sit-up test anytime, anywhere. But um, the sit-ups shouldn't be very difficult to deal with, okay? Josh, I hope that was okay. Well, folks, it's – Sad to say this, but the next time I interview with my friend Brian, I'll be back in the States, away from my beloved Galway. But until then, please keep sending questions into podcasts at danjohnworkouts.com, and we'll do our best to answer everything you ask, okay?